In my last video, I recap all the main world quests that are available during the current patch. It's quite a wild ride, I tell you that, but I can safely say that Nutland's world quest is a lot easier to digest than the Narcissus and Chris quest line, and we shall never forget the Aranara quest line. With that said, today's video is going to be all the theories I came up with from that video, some speculations, and how the quest line has a very strong connection with the Arkhan quest. With that said, disclaimers. This video will be all about theories based on what we know so far. It's also worth noting if I mention anything that is related to real life history, they're simply references and don't represent the actual in-game product. Theories are meant to be speculative, so don't take them seriously and take them with a huge grain of salt. Secondly, this is a leak free zone. Please don't comment anything about leak content, they're not yet confirmed, and I would personally refrain myself from using leaks for my lore recap and theory crafting. My Traveler of Jersey Seether, so I'll be referring to the Traveler as he in this video. Also, since we can name our little buddy, I'll be referring to the little buddy as the name I gave him, Terra, to make it easier for myself to recap and make theories in this video. Before we start, don't forget to give this video a like and comment so the channel can be noticed by the algorithm. I'm juggling my time doing my final year project, an artist, and video editing, so a little bit of boost will help this channel a lot, and that lets me know that I'm doing a good job. My name is Neko Gitsune, and I make lore and commentary videos on this channel to keep you company. First of all, Nutland's world quest line is surprisingly quite tight with the Arkham quest, because there are some connections with how Mavuika's power came to be and how Nutland chose their next Archons. In order to understand everything in this video, I highly recommend you to watch my previous video first, but if you don't have the time, I got you, I got a TLDR ready. Of course, because it's TLDR, I have to skip a lot of context, so I still recommend you to watch my previous video first, but this short recap is what you need to know in order to understand everything. We met with Terra, and from this onward, we occasionally heard voices from an unknown individual. We learned that Terra has been bestowed upon Flame Lord's Blessing, or also known as Shu Quaddle's Blessing. While it makes Terra stronger, Terra is also a Saurian from modern age, meaning he can't withstand the power, otherwise he'll go mad and die because of it. In order to save him, we have to bring him on a pilgrimage to the volcano and retrieve two tokens from places where we didn't know their whereabouts yet. Panku, someone from the Saurian Relic Association, decided to help us while we tried to find it ourselves, meeting two other NPCs in the process named Titu and Chikya. While we didn't find the whereabouts, we did learn something important from them. In Titu's case, we help him seal shadow pins in Salver's veins in order to prevent the abyss from escaping while also learning the origins of something called iridescent inscriptions. Basically, an ancient dragon language before Natlan is governed by the Power Archon that current Natlanists do not understand but able to use them to some degree. In Jigya's case, we help her to get to the Upper Sanctum, also known as Hanan Pacha, to help her dip into a hot spring infused with phlogiston. While doing her quest, we learn of an important figure named Waksakla Hunubakan, also known as the Sage of the Stolen Flame, who stole the seed of Logiston from the Great Dragon and taught humans how to use them. Because of this, we learned that humans can use Phlogiston and created something known as the Phlogiston Engravings, a language for humans to understand by using Phlogiston. We can safely say that iridescent inscriptions become Phlogiston Engravings after the Sage taught humans how to use Phlogiston. The Sage is also the one who created the Upper Sanctum. After helping these two, we then approach Manku who found the location of the first token, which is at some ruins near the Sulphur's Veins. We explore the ruins and learn that both the Sage and Shabalan made their vows to create new Age of Harmony for both humans and Saurians. Shabalanke is the first human who can use Phlogiston and became the Archon after he defeated a huge black dragon. After we clear the trials created by the Sage, we earn the first token and our next stop is to find the second token that is in a place called Okanatlan, the first city ever created in Atlan and is near the Flower Feather Clan on the western side of the map. This is where the 5.0 Atlan's major world quest ends. Now let's get into some theory crafting. Waksakla Hunubah Khan, or the Sage of the Stolen Flame, is obviously the person who talked to us when there's a golden inscription that we saw and is one of the biggest highlights of this patch's biggest figure. Considering that he is the one who talked to us, my theory is that there's a possibility that he is either still alive or his consciousness still remains until this day. It's important to note that he himself is a dragon. There are many people that say that he is a human, but I can assure you he is a dragon. This has been confirmed in the World Quest and the Obsidian Codex. The game doesn't necessarily mention why he decided to steal the seed of Logiston and teach humans how to use them, but we do know that he did what he did because he is interested in humans and that's that. 
At least, that's according to the Obsidian Codex, because there's actually more than that. In order for me to explain more about my theory just now, we have to talk about the timeline of Waksakla Hudubah Khan first. Thanks to Clementine for making an amazing video for the timeline, we learn more from the weapon essential materials and craftable weapons that Waksakla Hudubah Khan completely had it with the dragons of old antics back then because they used humans as sacrificial lambs and as prisoners. Because of this, he decided to steal the seed of Logiston and teach humans how to use them in hopes that a new era of both humans and dragons dragons living in harmony will be born. This does become the case at some point after Waksakla Hunubahkan and Shabalanke defeated a dragon named Shio Quadal, and this dragon is the same dragon from the mural Terra saw during the world quest. Now, how do I know this name? Because he is mentioned in the records of Hanan Pacha, a scroll that you can find in the Science of the Canopy, and the story in that scroll is quite aligned with the lore we received from the World Quest. I'll talk more about Shih Kwadal in a second, but the point is that Waksakla Hunubahkan, to me, is still alive because at one point after Shabalanke died, the city of Okanatlan or also known as the Cinder City was taken over by a king named Ochkan. Or you may know him as the Sacred Lord, who eventually, according to the Unfinished Reverie, become corrupted. During this time, he became known as the Tyrant King who wanted to kill Saurians because of his deep hatred and even ordered the humans back then to sever their connection with the Night Kingdom. This caused Waksakla Hunubahkan to be very disappointed with the humans to the point he left the city for good. The game never mentions Waksakla Hunubahkan to have died. But he left Natlan because of his disappointment. However, considering that he is the one who talked to us during the world quest, I believe that Waksakla Hunubahkan is still alive, and perhaps we might even meet him in the future. Dragons are long life species, according to the lore so far, because even a pep is the only original sovereign, if you will, that is still alive until this day, with Nuvalet, who is presumably the youngest sovereign that is alive now. We probably won't meet Waksakla Hunubahkan's body directly, but perhaps a soul of his like how we meet Elinas in the form of Melusine. Now, I know that Xiu Quadal is the Power Sovereign, but at the same time, the game doesn't directly confirm that he is the Dragon Sovereign. Still, I do believe that Xiu Quadal is the Sovereign, because for what reason Shabalanke tries to defeat him if he is none other than the Sovereign himself and even revived from Xiu Quadal's body? Even though Pakal doesn't directly mention it, he did remember a tale where the Pyro Archon became the Archon after the Pyro Dragon Sovereign died. Combine that with the tales we found in the records of Hanan Pacha and in the World Quest, this clearly suggests that Xiu Quadal is the Dragon Sovereign, and currently, he is dead. But of course, this information is still rather ambiguous, so I would suggest to take it with a grain of salt since the game doesn't really confirm that he is the Sovereign yet. But the hints do clearly suggest that he is one, so let's assume that Xiu Quadal is the Sovereign for now. At one point, I believe that the Power Sovereign could probably be reborn just like how the Hydro Sovereign was dead and now reborn as Nivellet in the form of a human. But I also think that might not be possible because resurrection is a common theme in Natlan, and it is the main theme within the Archon Quest where the Rite of Resurrection is literally trying to revive someone who has fallen from their battle against the Abyss. Combine that with the information we got from Nuvalet how the dragon's powers are the basis of the Archon's powers, it is not possible that Shiu Quadl is able to revive himself because even Nuvalet cannot give the people of Fontaine true human blood until Fosilor executed herself in order to return the Hydro Sovereign's authority over Hydro. Considering that Shiu Quadl lost his authority over Pyro and is now in the hands of the Pyro throne, there is no possible way that Shiu Quadl is able to revive himself. Now I can see why some of you think that my theory on this is bogus, but this is actually already explained to us all the way back in Inazuma, shocking I know, more specifically in Enkanomia, where we first learned about the prophecy behind Uvalet's reincarnation as the next Hydro Sovereign in the form of a human. Once again, Enkanomia is still relevant until this day, like literally the most basic of all things that is they've had. In the fourth volume of the Byaku Yakoku collection, two volumes after the Book of Sun and Moon, we learn that Fishaps will place their seed onto their next descendants, which is quite aligned with how the Hydro Sovereign reincarnates themselves, right? However, none of this indicated to the element of Pyro, 
meaning that Pyrofishups, or perhaps in this case Saurians, are unable to place their seed to their next descendants. And I believe this is because the power of resurrection is now lost and in the hands of the Pyro Archon. Either that, or they just don't have this sort of power in the first place because they are initially able to resurrect themselves but unable to do it anymore for the same reason. Because why do they need to place their seed to their next descendants if they can just revive themselves as the same person? This is literally the same thing we learn in the Arkham Quest, where the Rite of Resurrection literally revives people from falling on the hands of the Abyss, and they are revived as the same person. With that said, I don't think we'll ever meet Shu Quadal. He lost his power, and there's no possible way we can meet him. However, if we can't meet him as a living being, we will probably see his corpse at one point. Whether it's in the World Quest or in the Archon Quest, I do believe that his corpse is inside the volcano. My theory is that sovereigns are perhaps extremely long-lived species, or perhaps one can say that they're immortal. A pet being the proof of this, because she is the only original sovereign that still lives till this day. In case of Hydro, Yuvalet is the Hydro sovereign, but at one point, the previous dragon was able to maintain this status by placing their seed to their next descendant, and Yuvalet is the byproduct of it. There are some theories that Ashtaha is the Geo Sovereign, and there are very strong evidences that he could be one of them given the proof from the dialogues, referring to him as the Dragon King in other translations, and this title is always used to refer to other Dragon Sovereigns. But until the game confirms it themselves, this still remains a theory. There is also another theory that the Electro Sovereign is perhaps sealed underneath Inazuma, where the Thunder Sakura exists to seal something underneath it, according to Kukishinobu's sister, Miyuki, in the Sakura Abarism World Quest. So far, there's no solid evidence about this, so it's a very copy on theory for now. As for the Animal Sovereign, we might learn more about them during Durin's revival or when they release the second story quest for Fenty. The point is that all sovereigns seems to have some kind of existence in them, despite no longer wielding their authority over their respective element, and the pap did say that the dragons either hide or live together with the humans. In this case, I believe that the power sovereign is perhaps quote unquote dead, but not really dead. Think of it like Nivellet, okay? He is alive, he is the judge of Fontaine, he can control the primordial water, but without his authority, his power is just the same or slightly better than an ordinary fusion user. So, just like Nivellet, until their authority is returned, perhaps the power sovereign will be revived again as an alive dragon. Besides, we do see the proof of his power happen again till this day. Even though the power sovereign is dead, he is able to bestow blessings over Saurians. One of them is Terra, while the other that we know of so far is Moalani's boss material, Holawakang Obo. But the question is, will this happen though? Eh, probably not, but the possibility is there. Besides, Shabalanke did defeat that dragon in hopes to free humans from this dragon tyranny. So, until we meet Shabalanke in some way, I don't think we'll ever see Shu Quadl as an alive entity. I also find it a theme across Genshin that every sovereign has this sort of power that, if you will, became their identity, just like the Archons like the God of Freedom, Contracts, Eternity, etc. It seems that just like Nivellet whose power seems to be the authority over life, it seems that in Shu Quadl's case, it's the authority over resurrection, which makes sense because Shabalanke is revived after he defeated Shu Quadl and he was surrounded by fire. Not only that, Mahavuika also revived herself after she threw herself within the sacred fire. So perhaps this sacred fire is Shu Quadl's authority over Pyro, and I wouldn't be surprised that the location of the Pyronosis is inside the Sacred Fire, just like the Hydronosis inside the Oratrice. <laughs> Oratrice I can't help it, okay? Shut up! But there's also another possibility. Perhaps the Pyronosis is inside a consciousness in some way. You guys remember when Mavuika seemingly entered a realm of consciousness? This realm is very interesting because in the middle, we see a glowing light that seems to be a Pyro logo with the six stripes surrounding it. Perhaps the Pyronosis could also be stored here. And I think it would make sense because they know they don't have gods in Atlan. And in order to keep it safe and secure, perhaps they need to place it somewhere that can't be touched by someone else. Think of it like Faranara, okay? The only way we can enter this realm is by reacting to a certain object. The reason Aranara live here is to protect themselves from unnecessary dangers. Same like the Gnosis, perhaps there's a certain method to enter this place and perhaps only the Archon can enter this realm. 
It's also worth noting that perhaps the room that Mavuika entered in the ignition teaser was this place. The fact that she was even talking to someone is perhaps also the person she is trying to revive. Combined with the information we got from the world quest, perhaps this fire she is talking to is Shabalanka himself, or it could be even herself. I am writing this script before and after the 5.1 teaser is out, and like I said, the world quest and the Argon quest are very connected towards each other, at least that's how I see it. We also see in the trailer that we will, in some way, visit this place again. Either it's a traveler directly going there, or we'll see Mavrika visit this place again. Either way, we'll touch on this in a bit. I also want to decipher the mural we see in a bit. I don't really need to decipher the second mural because it's self-explanatory, but I do want to talk about the first mural. This seems a bit copious, but I don't think they're the same dragon because for one, they have different wings. And for two, the first mural seems to show us how this black dragon here was about to burn the ermine soul, and the people inside it are fanes with their shining shades. The only problem is that one of them seemingly is dead, and I can only think that perhaps this is Renova, a shining shade of death. We actually learned this name from Mavuika herself when she said that Shabalanke borrowed Renova's power to establish the rules of Natlan in the Arcade Quest. So, this is something I want to theorize. Shabalanke's victory came before Renova's death, perhaps. After defeating Shio Quadl, Renova gave their power to Shio Quadl before the arrival of his dragon. I also want to theorize that this dragon seems to be Nibelong, and perhaps they came after Shabalanke's victory and after Renova gave their power to Shabalanke. Either that, or Ranova already gave their power to Shabalanke when attempting to defeat Shu Quadl. So, there's also another theory. Perhaps the Sacred Fire's power is a combination of both Ranova's power and Shu Quadl's authority over Pyro. In any case, we still don't know how it works, but I am personally positive that this mural here talks about how Nibelong wants to burn the Ermine Soul. For what reason, we'll have to see in the future quest. The new boss material is called the Cornerstone of Stars and Flames, an object we got from the Archon Quest, Main World Quest, and the Tribal Chronicles. According to its description, it says that heroes ignite the Sacred Flame in order to illuminate the world, and they'll rest among the stars. They left this stone as their foundation in order to build an everlasting civilization. Of course, this description describes none other than how Natlan was built. And heroes in this case are of course the past heroes of Natlan that perhaps went on war to continue fueling the sacred fire. What makes it interesting is that perhaps this is just one of the pieces and we'll receive more of this in the future 5.1 quests. Unlike other essential materials where they are mostly an individual item, this item seems to resemble a Mayan weapon called Makwa Huidl, a combination of sword and a club with its edges made with obsidian. It is one of the most feared weapons ever in Aztec and Mesoamerican history. From sources I found at National Geographic's website and Wikipedia, Makwa Huitl is also used for certain ceremonies, where the Aztecs would bury the victims of this weapon half alive as a sacrifice for their gods. It hurts so bad to the point one hit from this weapon can almost lead you to death. Oh. Ah. But anyways, the point is that perhaps Shabalanke used Makwa Huitl infused with Phlogiston to fight against Shiu Quadl. That's just the smaller theory, but the bigger theory is that could this possibly hint on the fake sky? It's not a secret anymore that Teyvat's skies are indeed fake. We first learned this from the Unreconciled Stars event in 1.1, and if you're a newer player, you learned this in Sumeru's Arcan Quest when Dottore confronted Nahida. Even the image in this item seems very interesting. We see a seemingly a hole while there's a fiery logo that came out of it. It could mean a star because a star, in a nutshell, is a sphere covered in fire, and the sun is the closest star from Earth. The name of this item is also interesting, Cornerstone. Synonymously, Cornerstone is also the base, the basis, the foundation, or the interesting one, the first stone. Ever since Simulanka, I always believed that Natlan could be in some way very close to the borderland of Teyvat, and after we did the world quest, this solidified my belief that Natlan is indeed the borderline. Given that the billet series of Natlan is called Borderland Billet, and also the nation that is often invaded by the Abyss, I wouldn't be surprised that Natlan acts as the defense line for Teyvat. 
In any case, this cornerstone could perhaps be the weapon not only infused with phlogiston, but also in some way, a star. I wouldn't be surprised as this weapon even has some remnants of abyssal power given that the abyss seems to have a strong connection towards the stars with how much star symbolism we see on them. If this item is a part of a weapon, I think that the next boss that we'll face will be... <sighs> Shabalanke. Uh, I don't wanna. I want him to be playable. This guy is a giga chat. Please let him be playable instead of me. Oh yeah. Since we are done with that, let's talk about something more interesting. How does the Arkham Quest connect with the World Quest? Generally speaking, ever since version 1.0, the World Quest has its own set of story that separates the Arkham Quest to some degree. They are still connected, don't get me wrong, but not explicitly. Usually the World Quest talks about the history of the nation itself or perhaps explore the world of Teyvat by going to places that are locked behind it like underneath the Grand Arakami Shrine, the Ruined Golems, the Chasm, Remuria, etc. However, ever since Fontaine, they start to make the World Quest a lot more connected with the Arkham Quest, one of them being the Narcissus Quest questline, where the whole reason this organization exists in the first place is to prevent the prophecy from happening, but eventually start to lose its meaning after Rene found the world formula in Girdle of the Sands, where he became obsessed with saving the world by becoming an outside variable that can save Teyvat or in other words, trying to become a descender. But of course, this ended up not happening, but that's not the point that I'm trying to say. The point is that, ever since Fontaine, the Arkham Quest and the World Quest start to intertwine a lot more, and we do see this happening in Adlan as well. We learn about the first Pyro Archon from Avrika herself that he, in this case Shabalanke, created the rules of Natlan in order to select the next generations of the Pyro Archon. We also learn how Shabalanke became the Archon himself and how he made a pledge with Waksakla Hunubakan, who in this case is also a dragon, to create a new age of harmony of humans and dragons. We even learn that Shabalanke was revived after defeating Shu Quadl by reappearing from Shu Quadl's heart, surrounded in flames which in this case should be the origin of the sacred fire. Shabalanke is no questions asked, a very important figure. The fact that a world quest character to be mentioned in a playable character tree marketing, let alone to introduce a dragon sovereign, says a lot on how important Shabalanke actually is as a character. In this video I made a month ago, I speculate that Mavuika will die in the Arkham quest, and it seems that could likely be the case based on the trailer. Wow, shocker. Who could have seen that coming? Definitely not her being cursed as Himeko's XP, am I right? She ain't beating the Himeko allegations, okay? But of course, this could not always be the case, and I believe that she will be revived at some point. I mean, she has a model. Of course, she will stay alive after death, right? Right? But seriously though, I do believe despite being dead, she will be back again because she also has an ancient name. Judging from the video, we are of course going to fight the abyss so at one point, I believe we will achieve victory and defeat the abyss after that. However, considering that the rite of resurrection needs the Archon to be present, it will be tricky to actually think how they are going to revive her at some point. Maybe that's why there's no Archon quest in 5.2, because if there's no Archon, then the Archon needs to find a way to escape herself. I also noticed something very interesting. In the new pet we received from the anniversary, it specifically mentions Primal Fire, again. The first time we heard about the Primal Fire is from New Blood Street Marketing and I always thought that Primal Fire and the Sacred Fire are the same thing. But after looking at this again, my mind has changed and I don't think that's the case anymore. It doesn't seem that Primal Fire and the Sacred Fire are the same thing, considering that Shabalanke specifically mentioned that he is entombed in the Primal Fire. If the Sacred Fire is the Primal Fire, then wouldn't that make it too dangerous for something so valuable to be just in the open public? Given that in 5.1 is going to be our battle against the Abyss, and judging from the few, we'll be battling them in the open world, I don't think that Primal Fire and the Sacred Fire are the same. Perhaps the Primal Fire is hidden somewhere, and at this point, I believe that Shabalanke is still alive. Talking about the Primal Fire, perhaps this area here is the Primal Fire, and it seems that this place is indeed the place they store the Gnosis. I also find it fascinating that this place is shown again and we see the fire is extinguished this time. Perhaps after Mavrika took the Gnosis with her, she also took Shabalanke's life with her. Perhaps she is using the Gnosis to get the Sacred Fire back burning again. 
It's also interesting that I don't think people know this, but in this frame, the sacred fire is already extinguished. Combined with this frame here, the sacred fire seems to open the sky, and the hole in the sky looks very, very familiar. I'm sure you've seen this before. If you don't, then perhaps this will jog your memory. In a nutshell, we have visited what is beyond the sky, to some degree at least. Whatever this place may be, it is definitely connected to the all devouring novel. I also find it interesting that in this frame, presumably Overrun also said his soul is temporarily restrained by us and appears to have become more fragile in the process. Of course, this could refer to many people, and in fact, it could even refer to Overrun himself. But the thing is, whoever states that statement says soul which means the person they are referring to is probably not alive anymore, or in a state of life and death. Perhaps it's in Shilonet's Travel Chronicles, perhaps it's talking about someone else, who knows? But the fact that this statement someone refers to this person is being detained in some way makes me believe the only person I can think of is Shabalanke. I also mentioned in my last video that I don't think Mavuika has told us the full story of her plan, which definitely aligns with what Capitano said. Considering that the Fatui perhaps is going to help us in war against the Abyss in this frame, this also confirms one of my theories that Capitano is in fact not the villain in this current Archon quest. This also confirms one more thing, the Abyss Order and the Fatui are not in some type of way working with each other. I know that people already know this by now, but it further solidifies the point that because if they're working together, there is no way that the Fatui is going to help us battling against the Abyss because while the Abyss is not the Abyss Order, the Abyss Order is part of the Abyss. In any case, I personally believe that this is where we start to learn more about Mavuika's true plan, Capitano's identity, the truth behind the fake sky, and we might even learn more about Shabalanke or perhaps even the Sage of the Stolen Flame himself. I'm excited to see the new version and in the meantime, I'll be here as your quest recapper and your lore theorist. Before I end this video, I want to mention something very interesting mentioned in the Obsidian Codex artifact set. According to their goblet of Unithem, it says this. On that day, the living corpse on the throne would spit forth flame that could stain the sky red, and the new king would receive the primal fire as a tribute to them for ascension. On that day, the dragons would once more bow before the overlord of two worlds, and the knowledge of the countless years of civilization would be open to him. For it knew that the vows in the shadows were not far off. Indeed, they still hid in the night's deepest depths, waiting to strike a final blow. For it knew that neither the gods in the heavens nor the high king among dragons would suffice. All knowledge and strength had to be gathered before that day came. From how I see it, it's clear that Shabalanke has planned this preparation of war per se from the very beginning. He knew how strong the Abyss actually is. They're so strong that he confidently believes that not even the heavenly principles or Nibelong himself can defeat the Abyss. This makes a lot of sense because Nibelong himself tried to attack the heavenly principles again by using the forbidden knowledge and this power also came from the Abyss. If you ask me, perhaps Mavuika already knew this was the plan from Shabalanke himself. Gather as many resources as possible before the Abyss invades Natland once again. Whatever it may be, it is clear that both the World Quest and the Archon Quest are extremely intertwined. And how will this go on? Well, we'll just have to wait and see for ourselves later. This video is a bit shorter, but I do think I have said most of my points in this video. With that said, I'll be talking about Kinichi's Tribal Chronicles recap in my next video. Thank you so much for watching, please consider giving this video a like and comment so the channel can be noticed by the algorithm. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys on my next video. Ciao, mata!